Welcome, welcome everybody who is uh, joining us for this evening service. Um, we thank God that you got time to join us and to be together with us. Um, our Friday service of hope is one of our most important services that, that we hold. And therefore, I'm delighted that we can have time together to share the word. But more importantly, even to celebrate Easter together. Even if we are not able to meet like we always normally do, uh, but that we can be able to celebrate Easter together as we consider the goodness of the Lord and the things that the Lord has done for each and every one of us. I hope those on Zoom are able to get me clearly. You can wave if you can hear my voice very clearly. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. And uh, I can see there are several who have also joined us on, our, on, on Facebook. And I will pray, and then we get into sharing the word of God this evening. So let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you. We are so grateful that we can have an opportunity to come together through these technological um, enhancements to worship you, to praise you, but more importantly, to share your word. I pray that as we share your word this evening, it will come with power. It will bring alive that spirit of uh, Easter, the fact that you sent your son to come and die for us, that we may not lead miserable lives, but that we may have lives full of hope. We therefore thank you for this opportunity and welcome you that you may manifest your power, that you may manifest your wisdom, that you may manifest your words, and that you may speak to each and every one of us as you desire. Our hearts are open, minister to us, O oh Lord. And this is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. So thank you very much, everybody, for, uh, for joining me this evening. And uh, I want to believe that the Lord is going to bless us and, and, and minister to us uh, with his word. My name is Pastor Bernard Waroe Wairura. I minister with the Worldwide Gospel Church um, uh, at Kamulu, where we are broadcasting from this uh, evening. And I want to believe that the Lord will minister to us. My message today is entitled, um, The Credits of Calvary. The Credits of Calvary. The Credits of Calvary. Um, maybe I can provide a background to this, but before then, allow me to read the word of God from the book of John, chapter 19. John, chapter 19. And I will read uh, from verse 31. John, chapter 19. It's Easter. And I want to share a message um, of Easter with each and every one of us. And I want to believe that the Lord will bless us as we share together. John chapter 19, verse 31. John chapter 19, verse 31. The Bible says, I can hear some people are still opening their Bibles. Uh, please open, open your Bible. And... Um, Good. Yes, hope we have gotten there. John 19, verse 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the bodies should... Uh, sorry, sorry, not verse 31. I wanted to read from verse 28. John 19, from verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on high soap, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. He said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Uh, when I read um, this statement, there are several things that come to mind, and um, you'll allow me to bring in my professional uh, 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 or career into this and say that what comes to my mind as an accountant when I hear the words, it is finished, I think of a, an instant or a moment where people have been sitting around a table and have been trying to seal a deal. They have been trying to seal a deal. There is something they have been wanting to come to a conclusion to. Take, for example, let me use a, a more understandable example. Maybe it is lad that you have been wanting to buy. You have, been to, you have done the search at the, the Ministry of Lads. You've gotten your surveyor. 
you have gone to the bank, you've taken loans, you've done so many things, and now you come to a moment and sit on the table and there is an exchange. There is an exchange of money, there is an exchange of documents, a signing of documents and exchanging of the documents. And after everything is done, I, I, I can hear those who are party to the transaction saying, it is finished, the deal is done, it is settled. You know, everything has been done, the payments have been done, the documents have been signed, the, search, the searches have come out clean, and the deal is sealed. The deal is sealed. The lad now has changed hands. There is an exchange between the one who owned the lad a few minutes ago to the one who have just received the, 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 the lad to be theirs um, in, in, that, in that instance. And therefore, the deal has been sealed. The deal has been sealed. God made Jesus a public spectacle to declare the redemption of men and the restoration of his relationship with man. That God decided that he is not going to secure or complete this deal behind doors like many of us would do. But he decided that he would make it a public spectacle that everybody would watch and see as the deal is being sealed, as, as man is being restored back to God, as the devil is losing and the kingdom of God is gaining. And Jesus has been crucified. He has gone through a lot of humiliation. He, he, has, he has been beaten. Stripes have gone to his back and nails have gone into his hands. Nails have gone into his feet. And now he sits on the cross and at that particular moment he realizes that the deal as God had declared it has been sealed and for prophecy to be fulfilled because everything that was written about Jesus and everything that was written about the redemptive plan of God was fulfilled. No prophecy was left unfulfilled. No prophecy was left unfulfilled. All the prophecies that came in the Old Testament were fulfilled. And, and Jesus realized that time has come. The deal is just about to get sealed. But there's one thing that was remaining. And he said, I thirst. And the moment they put a sponge into that bitter, sour, you know, they, they just were, wanted to humiliate him. And then dip it in a high soap, put it on a stick. They gave it to him. The moment he tasted that bitter thing and the prophecy was perfectly accomplished, Jesus said very strong words. He said, it is finished. It is finished. The deal is sealed. The deal is done. God has restored man back to himself. Sin no longer has power over man. The relationship is taken back. He said, it is finished. I do not know what these words mean to you. Or I do not know when you hear them, what they say to you. But I want to assure you that Jesus was saying that the deal had been sealed. Jesus was saying that the deal had been sealed. And as you continue allowing me, your indulgence in my profession as a finance person, I said that the title of our message today is The Credits of Calvary. Every time I get a text message from my bank, there are four things that are of concern to me. There are four things that I, that I look out for. The first thing that I look out for is, is my message saying it's a credit or a debit. If it says it's a credit, I know that is money that has come into my account. If it says it's a debit, I know that is money that has gone out of my account. So that is the first thing that I look for in every text message that comes from my bank. The second thing that I, I, I check for is the amount. 
how much has gone in or how much has gone out. That is, that is the, that, the, second, the second thing that I, 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 I look for. The second thing that I look for. The third thing that, that, I, that I look for within that um, message is where, where that money might be coming from. So that I have to maybe think within myself. I have to ask myself um, uh, a few questions to be able to, to tell where is this money coming from. And then if I'm able to answer that question, then the fourth question I have to ask myself is what is the money for? Because you don't want to use money that has been put in your account for you to do some office work, to do several other things. And therefore, those four questions are very important. But today, I want us to think about the first two. The first two. The first one I ask myself, is it a credit or is it a debit? And that is why I entitled my message today, The Credits of Calvary. It's because when Jesus went on the cross, there was no debit that got into my, into my account. It, it, was, it was benefits that came into my account as a, as a believer. And the second thing that I want us to think about and, 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 and look at is ask ourselves, if these are credits, then what are they? I always ask myself, what is the amount? How much has gone in or how much has gone out? So what are these credits and how can we make sure that we are able to make use of them. So, based on that banking term, I'm asking myself, and I wish to welcome you this evening, that we may ask ourselves, what are the benefits that we got on Calvary? What are the benefits that we got on Calvary? When God sacrificed his son on the cross, why did he do that? And what can we access by virtue of that death that Jesus Christ went through, that humiliating experience, that public spectacle that I have said God had to use that public spectacle to declare to the world and to everybody that it is done, it is done. I will give you five things that are very common. I don't intend that they are exhaustive of all the credits that we got on Calvary, but they represent a bigger picture of what Jesus did for us on the cross. The second thing that you realize about the things that I'm just about to share is that they may sound basic and common to every believer. But the question that I've always asked myself is why do we have believers that are struggling with things that we expect to be basic? When we talk about forgiveness of sins, when we talk about restoration of our relationship with God, why do we still have believers that are still struggling with forgiveness of sin, whereas we think it is basic? And that is why I, I wish to present these things to you in this message. I have a, well docu a, a nice document um, uh, put, having put this down so I can share it with you if you want later. There's someone I can share it with you on PDF and um, I'll only share it to, with people who will request. I don't intend to send documents um, uh, to people maybe who will not read them or who will see them just as um, forwards that have come into their inbox, but I'll only share with those people who are going to make requests for them. After I look at these credits, credits of Calvary, on Sunday at 12.30, I will be looking at some of the factors or the things that make believers not fully enjoy the benefits that Christ got for us at Calvary. And, and therefore, I ask you to join me even on Sunday as we look at this. But allow me to share with you five things that Jesus got for us at Calvary. Number one is forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. In John chapter 1, verse 29, as Jesus was uh, approaching John the Baptist to be baptized, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Jesus Christ, he saw the one who would be sacrificed, just like a lamb is sacrificed, and through that sacrifice, the sins of the world would be taken away. But these sins of the world were not to be taken away just like that, but there was a need of faith. The difference he saw between the lambs that he had seen in his day having gone through the religion of Judaism 
And Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that he saw coming to him for baptism, as one who would be sacrificed for sin, is two. That number one, this Lamb was to come directly from God. Initially, the sinner, the person who needed the redemption of their sins, had to bring a Lamb themselves. They had to pay a price. They had to provide, they had to make a sacrifice for their sins to be taken away. They had to themselves come with the lamb to be sacrificed. But now the difference this time is that God himself had provided a lamb for the sacrifice. God himself had provided the lamb to be sacrificed. And, and that is very pivotal. That is very important for every believer. That it, this is a gift of grace. I'll, I'll never stop talking about grace. And like you can see behind me is our banner with grace on it as our theme. God himself gave the lamb that was to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. Number two is that John saw a, perf a perfect and effectual sacrifice in Jesus Christ. What do I mean? That as John looked at this Lamb of God that was to be sacrificed, that was to take away the sin of men, in this Lamb, he saw a finality in sacrifices. That even though the other lambs that were always provided had to be provided time and after time and after time, but for this particular one, the sacrifice was being made once and for all. It was a perfect, effective sacrifice. So those two things were very, very important. Were very, very important. That God has, was the one who had provided the lamb. And not only had God provided the lamb, but this was to be with finality. It was to be with finality. And therefore, John looked at... Um, John looked at uh, this lamb that was to be sacrificed, and as he looked at this lamb that was to be sacrificed, he saw that God had done the final sacrifice for sin. For sin. What do I want to say this evening to each and every one of us? That Jesus Christ came to take away your sins and my sins, and upon my surrender and your surrender, to Jesus Christ, by faith, we receive salvation. And, and, and you can see that in um, Romans chapter 10, from verse 9 to 13. Romans chapter 10, from verse 9 to 13. And please, if um, on any of the applications, either on Zoom or Facebook, if you have any difficulties, just, just, just let me know. Just comment, and, and I will be able to... Uh, uh, to see that. John, uh, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 to 13, and maybe we can read. Um, uh, we can read. We are not in so much of a hurry that we cannot get time to read the word of God together. Romans chapter 9, um, uh, from verse 9. Romans chapter 10, from verse 9. Romans chapter 10 from verse 9. So if you have your Bible, you will also go there with me and read together with me. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. And the, the, the major question that we have to ask ourselves here is what is this salvation? And I can submit to you this evening that this salvation is remission of sins. It's God stopping counting you as a sinner. It's getting justified. Justification is, is a legal term. 
is a legal term that is used to mean one has been taken before the, the jury and he has been taken for judgment. He has been taken that a judgment may be given, a ruling may be given for the sins that he has committed. But what is God saying? That you have been justified. And therefore, our justification is brought about by the forgiveness of our sins. That we have believed in our hearts, we have confessed with our mouths, and our sins have been taken away. This forgiveness of sins is not only limited to what we have committed up to the point of salvation. Although I later learn talk about freedom from sin and talk about believers and their relationship between themselves and, 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 and sin, it is important for us to take note that it is provided for us forgiveness, not only at the point of salvation, but also even when we have committed sins as, as believers. But I'll, I'll be huddling that and I'll look at that later. Why do I think that it is good for me this evening to remind you that this evening your sins are forgiven? It is because I have met many believers who are still living under the burden of sins they committed even before they gave their lives to Christ. I've met believers who have not received full liberty from the sins they had committed before. They have given their lives to Christ, but they walk with a yoke of things they did before. They walk with um, an attitude of things that come to me are coming to me because of the things that I did. They still are under the, the, the guilt of sins that they committed before they gave their lives to Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, our sins are forgiven. Jesus was made a public spectacle. He, he took that burden upon himself. He allowed that the shame that came with being hanged on the cross would be on him, that our sins may be forgiven. Therefore, stop living under the guilt or the condemnation of sins that you committed before you came to Christ. But I want to say that there is a forgiveness of sins that God has promised us even after we have come to him. John, in his first letter, chapter 2, says some very, very important things. Number one, he says, I write to you, little children, that you may not sin. The objective of John was that those he was writing to may not sin. That must be the objective of every believer. The objective of every believer must be that they will lead lives that are holy, that they will lead lives that are without sin. But John continued and said in that same chapter 2 of 1 John that if we sinned, we had an advocate with the Father. He positioned Jesus Christ in the position of an advocate, one who speaks on our behalf. So, for the sins we committed before we gave our life to Christ, Jesus took them away. And therefore, at the point of our giving our life to Christ, all the sins that we committed before we came to Christ are dealt with with finality. They are dealt with with finality. Then after that, in case... After that, the objective of every believer, and I'll be talking about that, is that you must not sin. You must lead lives that are holy and pure before God. But John says, if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. The resurrected Christ who is seated at the right hand of God is an advocate with the Father. And what does he do? He pleads for mercy for us. And if you go back to 1 John 1, 9, he says that if we confess our sins, then God is faithful and he will forgive us. And therefore, the death and the resurrection of Christ represents for us forgiveness of our sins. Both our sins before we gave our lives to Christ and our sins after we have come to Christ, we are forgiven. We are forgiven. What is my point here? My point is this. As a believer, you need not live in the guilt 
and the expected punishment of your sins. Christ already dealt with them. There are many Christians who continue in the guilt of their sins that were committed even before coming to Christ. I have also found another category who interprets the happening of their, in their lives that are present as a punishment or God who is dealing with them as a result of sins they committed or have committed. I want to say this, that when God forgives us our sins, he God forgives us those sins with finality. Our God is not a God who will follow us with punitive actions because of confessed sins. Many times we have asked that he forgives our sins. Brothers and sisters, if you have done that, believe that you are forgiven. Believe that you are forgiven. When, and, and, and the times when people will speak that for us to enjoy the liberty of um, the forgiveness of our sins, we need to also forgive ourselves. But I've gotten to a point where I think it is not that we don't forgive ourselves. It is that we don't accept the forgiveness of God on our sins. Sometimes we see as if our sins are, are very glaring, as if they are too bad, and therefore we don't accept the forgiveness of God for the sins that we have committed. Brethren, that would be very devastating and would even not please God that he has forgiven us our sins, but we are continuing in the anguish and in the guilt of sins he has forgiven us. Jesus Christ went through the pain he went through. He went through the humiliation he went through. He went through the shame and the reproach for the forgiveness of your sins. Therefore, accept that you are forgiven. Accept that you have been set free. Accept that God has dealt with the consequences of your sins and with finality has set you free. And if you have confessed your sins, he does not count any of those sins against you. Praise the name of the Lord. Number two, number one is forgiveness of sins. Number two is restored relationship with God. One of the things that God or Jesus Christ obtained for us upon the cross is a restored relationship. Severally, I have met people who have told me that they have forgiven their offenders. They say, I have forgiven him. I have forgiven her. But, they will always have a but. I cannot go back to the relationship that we had before. I have heard people who have said, once beaten, twice shy. I have forgiven him. I have forgiven her. And, and I believe them. I, I believe for truly, they have forgiven these people. But they say, our relationship cannot go back where it was. And therefore, I have come to the conclusion that there is a difference between forgiving someone and restoring the relationship. And restoring the relationship. Sorry for those who are on Zoom. There is a difference between for forgiving someone and restoring the relationship that you had with them before. I've even met people who are divorcing. And one party tells me, I have forgiven him for everything that he did to me. But we will divorce. Why? Because there's a difference between forgiveness and restoration of a relationship. And that is the revelation that I got. That when Jesus went on the cross and died for our sins, he did not only obtain forgiveness for our sins, but there is something else that he obtained for us, a restored relationship between us and God. That he journeys, he journeyed back to Eden. He journeyed back to Eden to restore that relationship that God had desired when he created man. That the relationship between man and God was marred by sin. It was destroyed by sin. And therefore, other than the taking away of sin, there was a need 
for restoration. In the book of 2 Corinthians, we can read um, 2 Corinthians, no, you can write this one, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, you can write that. Paul is telling us that we have been reconciled back to God. That for us to become ministers of reconciliation, what has happened is that we have been reconciled back. Because there are people who will forgive you, but they will not give room for reconciliation. They will not give room for a restored relationship. But God is saying, I will forgive you and I'll also provide room for reconciliation. I'll restore you back to myself that you may enjoy that state of forgiven sin. You know, you know somebody can forgive you your sins, but you, you can't enjoy that forgiveness because whatever you enjoyed before the sins came has not been brought back. But I would like us to read the book of Romans, chapter 5, from verse 1. Romans is a very powerful book. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. If you're there, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. The Bible says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Even if I was to get on right to there, these are very sweet words. I don't know whether they are sweet as you listen to them. That therefore, having been justified by faith, and what is justification? Our sins taken away, we have been counted as the righteousness of God. We have peace. So, justification is not enough. Justification is not the only thing that we have obtained. We have peace with God. We have been reconciled back. A relationship has been restored. A relationship has been restored. And it has become our portion. Praise the name of the Lord. We therefore are not only able to enjoy a state of forgiven sins, but we are also able to enjoy the full benefits of a restored relationship. The full benefits of a restored relationship. That if I'm forgiven, would I have prayed before I sinned? And then sin made prayer difficult. Now I can go back to the state of that fellowship with God. There are many of us, although we believe that our sins have been forgiven, we have not been able to enjoy a restored relationship with God. We do not have peace with God. Peace with God is seen as distant and unachievable. And I've met many believers who feel like peace with God is something distant, is something that can never be achieved. Every time they feel like they are enjoying a relationship with God, they find something that stands in between them and God. They feel their sins come to the fore. It's like they, they are going to, to speak to God, but instead of seeing God, they see their sins being reflected on a mirror. They are not able to enjoy a relationship with God. But sometimes this is something that is a matter of attitude. Sometimes it's a matter of faith, and I'll be speaking about faith on Sunday in terms of accessing all these benefits. But believe me today, Jesus died that your relationship with God may be restored, that you may have fellowship with God, that you may have full access to God as your father. That as the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, Romans chapter 8, verse 15, you may be able to cry to God, Abba, Father. The other day, I asked a question because I wondered if a child belongs to my sister or my brother or a child belongs to a wife maybe whom I have married with a child, why do I have to go to the government and go through the process of adoption? Go through the process of adoption 
a very tedious. Why don't I just welcome them into my house and have them in my house and give them full access to education, full access to pay their medical care and do everything? And the answer I got made a difference in terms of how I understand the concept of adoption when God says that we have been adopted into his household that we may become sons. That the reason why somebody will go through a very tedious process of adoption other than just welcoming a child in the house is because adoption gives legal recognition to the child as a member of that family. Adoption gives legal recognition that after I have obtained adoption for that child, they can access every benefit that a child born in my family would access. That if I go with a certificate of adoption to my workplace, it is considered just like a birth certificate would be considered for my daughter or my son. If I go with a certificate of adoption to get a visa if I'm traveling, it will be considered just like a birth certificate for my child would be considered. That that child will be given full benefits without any discrimination. God is saying in Romans chapter 8 that he has adopted through the death of his son Jesus Christ on, on the cross. We have gone through the process of adoption and have received a certificate of adoption. And we therefore can access full benefits as, th as those born in the family of God. Hallelujah. Brethren, we have a restored relationship. We can access the full benefits of being members of the household of God. And none of us ought to feel like some are better than others. Levredouaroe is not better than you who is watching me. We all are children with equal rights. With a certificate of adoption and with full access to all the benefits of every believer. And therefore, as we celebrate this Easter, one of the credit that has entered into your account and you can access it and enjoy it is that you have been restored back to God. That forgiveness of sins is not alone. We need a restoration of our relationship. There are no privileged siblings when it comes to God. If there is something that you are seeing your brother or your sister enjoying, everybody else that has responded by faith to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross has access to. Do not feel yourself and one, as one who cannot access your father fully and see others as better placed. If you have responded to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross by faith as a means through which you have been reconciled back to God, accept that restored relationship and live by it. You are at peace with God. You should live as such. Stop counting your former state and seeing as if God is dealing with you based on your former state. Consider your restored relationship and enjoy it in the presence of God. So I've said the credit number one is that we have forgiveness of sins. Credit number two is that we have been restored. God has restored us back to a relationship with him. Credit number three is freedom from our past. Freedom from our past. This may sound simplistic as I mention it, but when I see the number of men and women spending themselves, spending money, sowing seeds and doing all manner of things to receive freedom from their past or to deal with what they think is a consequence of things that are coming from their past, I feel we need to be reminded that when Jesus went on the cross, he dealt with our past. The words of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and I will read it, 2 Corinthians, go with me there. Chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 17. It 
Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I'm buying time. I'm starting another session um, with Zoom. And uh, I want to believe those who are joining on Zoom can join the second session. Please feel free to join the second session. So, chapter 5, Second Corinthians, verse 17. The Bible says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And we had talked about verse 18. But first of all, this, this is very strong. This is very strong. This is very strong. And, and Shaorin, if you find Zoom better, you can go back uh, uh, and, and join the second meeting. Yes, thank you for moving to FB. Uh, but Zoom is still on. Uh, you, could, you could still join. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. These words sound very simplistic. They sound like they are very easy for people to understand. But what amazes me is that every day I come across people who, who struggles, whose challenges would be resolved by just taking these words and making them yours. That at the point when I came to Christ, I had a past. At the point when I came to Christ, there are things that had taken place, whether by virtue of me, whether by virtue of my great-grandmother, whether by virtue of my grandfather, whether by virtue of my grandfather. There are things that had taken place in my life before I came to Christ. But when I came to Christ, there is something that happened and I started by saying that at Calvary, there was an exchange, like there would be an exchange on the table when people are exchanging documents for lard and exchanging checks. And Jesus said, it is finished. The deal has been sealed. And therefore, when we come to Christ, at the point when we give our life to Jesus, it is like we are going back to Calvary. And we are st sitting at the table of Calvary. And the moment we say, Jesus Christ, come into my life. What happens? A deal is sealed. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 describes this deal so well. That whoever is in Christ Jesus, at the point of entering into Christ Jesus instantly becomes a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. We therefore do not need to do anything else after we have given our lives to Christ. And, and that, is the, that is the heresy. That is the heresy that is preached by false teachers. That salvation alone is not enough. That we have to do this and that. We have to go here and there. We have to sow a seed here and there for us to receive full recovery from the omissions and the commissions of our past. Brethren, when we receive this newness of life, let us believe that we have received it. Let us not go back from where we came from. You don't need to sow a seed to be redeemed from some things that happened in your past. Whether they were done by your great-grandmother, whether they were done by your father or your grandfather, you do not need to go even and sacrifice on their graves. No, the moment you came to Christ, he dealt with your past. What you need to do is to start living in the newness of life that you have received that you have received. But there's also another aspect that I want to bring out. Because there are many who come to Christ, but they find it hard to let go. They find it hard to let go the past. 
They find it hard to let go their sinful relationships. They find it hard to let go their sinful habits. They find it hard to let go their ungodly cultures. They find it hard to let go their ungodly business deals. Some think of the financial losses that they will go through now that they have given their lives to Christ. They think of the social security that they will lose after they have come to Christ and Christ is requiring that they now live in the newness of life that he has given them. I want to say, brethren, for the newness of life that we have received to be actualized, we must abandon our past selves. We must die to our past, like the Bible is telling us in the book of Romans. We must die to our past. We cannot continue clinging to our past sinful nature, our past sinful things, and still expect to enjoy the liberation that comes with the newness of life that we receive when we come to Christ. It is like one hanging on a cliff, and he is being told, for you to be saved, release what you are holding on, and we still hold on our past, and we refuse to let go. Please, let go your past. Christ died on the cross to deal with that past. Don't live in the past again. Come to the newness of life that Christ has given you. Credit number one, forgiveness of sins. Credit number two, restored relationship. Credit number three, freedom from our past. Credit number four is freedom from the bondage of sin. Freedom from the bondage of sin. Why do believers continue in a life of fear and struggles with sin while they have already received Christ as their personal Lord and Savior? I'll be looking at some of these things on Sunday. But allow me to say this, that the ultimate freedom of any believer at the point when they give their lives to Christ is the freedom described in Romans chapter 6 from verse 1 to 7. Let us go there. Romans 6, 1 to 7. I know we had uh, led verse 1, but allow us to go there again. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 7, if you're there, please lead with me. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we, who died to sin, live any longer in it? Very, very important that giving our lives to Christ is symbolic of dying to sin. And therefore the question is, if you are dead to sin, how can you again continue living in that same sin? Or do you not know that as many as are, were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. And I've talked about that newness of life. Verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've talked about clinging and holding on to the old self. The old man was crucified, and crucifixion is not easy. Crucifixion, crucifi <laughs> crucifixion is difficult. Crucifying the old nature is not easy. When you are hurt, you feel like you want to hurt. But you have been crucified with Christ, it's difficult. But let me go on to where I want to point. Verse 6, knowing is, no, verse, verse 7 now. 
verse 6, let me read. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. He who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Let us, let us just get up to there. What we are saying is that in verse 7, is that for he who has died has been freed from sin. Brethren, one of the credits we received when Jesus died on the cross is freedom from our sins. Verse 12, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its last. And don't, do not present your members as instruments of righteousness to sin. What am I saying? I'm saying this. That we are no longer slaves to sin. But we are slaves to righteousness. We have received freedom from the bondage of sin. And therefore, we cannot sin out of being subdued by the power of sin. This is because we are free from the power of sin and the power that operates within us is greater than the power of sin. And like the Bible is saying in verse 12 of Romans chapter 6, is that believers can only sin by they themselves letting or surrendering their bodies, their mortal bodies, to sin. Their mortal bodies to sin. And therefore he admonishes us that we should not obey the rusts of sin by surrendering our bodies to sin. For those who have heard me before, I've always compared sin to an elevator where you start and you have the power within yourself to either step on the elevator or not step on it. If you step on the elevator, what happens is that you lose your power. You lose your power if you start, you start on the elevator. That is how we are as believers. We have received freedom from sin. We, we cannot sin by being subdued by sin. We can only sin voluntarily by surrendering ourselves to the enticement of sin. And you can read about the enticement of sin. I think it's from the book of uh, First Peter. First Peter, let me see, sorry. Once I get that, I'll be able to, 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 let, to let you know uh, about it. It is that we are enticed, we are, we, are, we are pulled into sin. Therefore, what am I saying? You have received, one of the credits you have received is freedom from sin. Freedom. You are not under bondage. And therefore, you cannot feign being overpowered by sin. Access the power that you have received so that you may not give in to sin. Bottom line, we are free from sins. We are no longer slaves of sin, but righteousness, because Christ has died for us. Therefore, if we have to sin, we sin voluntarily. We sin because we have surrendered our bodies to sin. Therefore, be careful how you live. Finally, the last credit, as I finish this, I'll be very brief on this one. We have received healing for our bodies and our souls. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ obtained for us healing, not only for our physical bodies, but also for our souls. It is an act that births hope in a depraved soul. It is an assurance that is received by one who goes through affliction and trouble but remains joyful 
and hopeful. As Jesus headed to Calvary to be crucified, they beat him. And by those stripes, we are healed. We are healed. We are healed. I submit to you that physical health is of no use if one has not received the effectual healing of his soul. No matter how much they own or may access, they will always be troubled. The human soul without Christ is sick. The human soul without Christ cannot access joy, cannot access peace, cannot access the fulfillment and the settlement that Jesus provides for us. The heart, like Jeremiah said, is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? Jesus Christ is the only one who can heal the depravity, who can heal the deceitfulness of our souls. He's the only one who can provide joy and peace to ourselves. But more than providing us with healing for our souls, Jesus Christ also provides us healing for our bodies. I believe in miraculous healing. I believe in healing by intervention of medicine. I even believe in healing by nutritional carefulness, if I may call it so. And I believe that all these are provisions that have been given to us by God, that we may receive healing for ourselves. Are you sick? God is able and willing to heal you. By the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. Five credits that were deposited into your account at Calvary, that if Jesus was a bank that would be sending a text message to you, it will read, your account has been credited with forgiveness of sins. Your account has been credited with a restored relationship. Your account has been credited with freedom from the past. Your account has been credited with freedom from the bondage of sin. Your account has been credited with hearing both for your soul and for your physical body. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much for being there. I bless the name of the Lord that you are able to join me and you are able to hear the word of God. I'm going to ask our deacon, Sammy Jojo. I'm going to ask our deacon, Sammy Jojo. I have unmuted you. Kaidre, pray for us, and then we'll have finished our broadcast today. Pray for us, Sammy. Sammy, can you hear me? Sammy, can you hear me? Yes, pray for us. Pray for us as we finish. Oh, we cannot hear you. Sorry. If uh, maybe your mic is not able to get through. So I'm going to ask Naomi Duta to pray for us. So let me unmute you so that you are able to pray for us, Naomi. Naomi, go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you. We give you praise this evening. Thank you for the word that you have ministered into our hearts. Thank you for installing your heart to God. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for the restoration of the relationship into you, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, even for the freedom because you are never access to, to sin to your sleep to righteousness. Father, we thank you and we give you praise, O oh God. Thank you for depositing it in our hearts, O oh God. And thank you, God, for dying on the cross because of our sins, O oh God. We give you praise and we give you honor with this believing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you so much, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. See you on Sunday at 1230. And God bless you. You can un unmute yourself and say... Bye.
Are you saying goodbye? I'm expecting.